Uh, you have actually a specific picture in the uh, exercise B of uh, the microscope you're using. It's actually pictured on page B4. On page B4 is a drawing of the actual microscope you're using. Okay, so uh, on this drawing, obviously these are the uh, ocular or eyepiece lenses uh, that you can see right here. These are called eyepiece or ocular lenses. Ocular or eyepiece refers to your eyes. And then uh, attached to these uh, turret or revolving nose piece are these objective lenses. And I believe that you've got uh, four objective lenses. Is that right? Are there four? Three or four? four. Yeah, four. You have four objective lenses. We're going to go through them. This flat area right here is called the stage of the microscope, and that's where you attach a slide. We're going to look at a slide in just a moment. And uh, you'll notice that it shows that right below the stage, there's something called an iris diaphragm lever, which I'm going to be explaining. And uh, we also have what controls the light level, is there's a little knob right here that you can turn that uh, makes the light come on brighter or less bright. Uh, we call the bottom of the microscope the base of the microscope. Uh, you'll see that uh, there's some knobs right here that are used to uh, move the uh, slide uh, on the stage. These are for moving the uh, slide on the stage. And then the focusing knobs are right here. And there's a outer coarse focusing and then an inner fine focusing. So the outer knob here is for gross or uh, general focusing and fine tuning is uh, the inner knob. And of course, right up here, this is called the arm of the microscope. So those, those are the uh, parts of the microscope. So uh, let's kind of walk our way through this a little bit more uh, specifically. On the previous page B3, page B3, so the parts of the compound microscope. Uh, now, uh, we've mentioned the arm, we've mentioned the base lamp, and so on, the stage, uh, the ocular or eyepiece lens, and the ocular lens that you look through has a magnifying power of 10x. And that means that if you were just using this ocular lens alone, it would make whatever you were looking at appear 10 times bigger than it really is. Now, when you look through the uh, microscope, you'll see a circular area that is lit up, illuminated. That's called the field of view. That's this circular thing that is lit up. Now, if you don't see anything when you look through it, don't worry about it. We're going to get it all corrected in just a moment. The magnifying power refers to how many times larger some, an object appears to be compared to how big it truly is. So we've already said that the eyepiece, or ocular lenses, make something appear 10 times bigger than they really are. But there's another term called resolving power. So what's resolving power? How is that different from magnifying power? The resolving power, or resolution, is the sharpness, sharpness of the image. That's how sharp the image is. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's imagine that uh, you were interested in buying a microscope. And let's say you go to a, a store where they sell microscopes. Maybe you're on, doing it online. And there's two microscopes for sale. And let's just say one of them is uh, $2,000. All right, let's say it's actually $2,500. So you got a microscope selling for $2,500, and you have a microscope selling for $29.95. Now, let's say that they both, let's say they both magnify one, a maximum of 1,000 times. So both of them have a magnifying power of 1,000x. 1,000x means that they make whatever you're looking at appear 1,000 times bigger than they really are. Now, the question is, how come one, if it magnifies uh, a thousand times, 
how can one sell for $30 and the other is $2,500? There has to be a difference in quality. And the difference is the resolving power resolution. They both magnify the same amount, but this cheaper one, it's all blurry. The good quality one is a sharp image. That's called resolution or resolving power. It creates a really sharp image. And in my mind, that's really more important than how big it makes it. Because just having something really big, enlarged, very, uh, make, making it appear very big, but it's all blurry, who, well, what difference does it make? You can't even make it out. If something is even enlarged smaller, not quite as big, but it's really crystal clear and sharp, then that's better. So what you're really paying for with optics is the resolving palette. On, uh, on page uh, B5, on B5, the revolving nose piece. So uh, that's that uh, turret or nose piece that you can turn. And attached to it are four objective lenses. Now, remember, the reason why this is called a compound light microscope, this is called a compound microscope because it magnifies it with two sets of lenses. You'd say, what do you mean? The ocular lens you look through magnifies 10 times, but also you've got those objective lenses that also magnify. So you compounded or in increased the amount of magnification. Now, there are four objective lenses. There's a scanning, low power, high power, and oil immersion. They have a red, uh, they have a band, a colored band around them. The scanning has a red band, the low power has a yellow band, the high power has a blue band, and the oil immersion has a black band. I don't care that you know the color. But uh, we would like you to know the magnifying power. The scanning, if you actually look at it, which is the shortest one, it's the shortest objective lens, it's got a red band, you'll see it actually has a number four on it. Can anybody make it out? Can you see that? The shortest lens says it has a number four. It magnifies four times. Now, since your ocular lens, since your ocular lens magnifies ten times, so if you click that into place, if you click the scanning, lens, objective lens, into place. And you should actually feel it click. Uh, that means that now, when you look through the um, uh, microscope, the scanning magnifies four times. The ocular lens that you've got your eyes looking through magnifies 10 times. So what's the total magnification? 10 times 4 or 40. 40x. That's the lowest magnification there is. Now, the diameter of the field of view for this is 4,000 micrometers. You'd say, what does that mean? I'll tell you what that means in just a moment. Now, the next longer, the next longer lens is the low power objective. It has a number 10 on it. It magnifies 10 times. So if you click that next second longer lens into place, now you've got a total magnifying power of 100x. You'd say, how do you get 100? 10 times 10. Because the ocular lens, the eyepiece lens, magnifies 10 times. Now, if you click the next longer lens in place, which has a blue uh, band around it, you'll actually see it has a number 40 written on it. So when you click that into place, now you've increased your total magnification to 400x. That means whatever you're looking at is 400 times bigger than it really is. And then finally, the longest lens that you've got, the fourth one, which has a black band on it, You'll see it actually has the number 100 written on it. When you click that into place, your total magnification is 10 times 100, or 1,000x. It makes something appear 1,000 times bigger than it really is. All right, so these are not inexpensive, crummy microscopes. They really give us big magnifying power. In general, in general, in this class, we are primarily going to be using these first three. We're not generally going to be using the oil immersion lens. First off, we don't need to go to that high, really high extreme magnification most of the time. But there's another problem with using that lens. It has a funny name, doesn't it? Oil immersion. Why do they call it oil immersion? Uh, the answer is, if you look on page B8, so I'm going to make a note, C page B8. If you look at page B8, at the bottom, at the
at the very bottom of B8, it says using the oil immersion objective. And in, oil, in order to use the oil immersion objective lens, you actually have to, and you can see, pour oil right on the slide. That's why it's called oil immersion. And that means not only do you have to put oil on the slide, you also have to clean off the oil when you're done. So that's another reason why we're not generally going to use that uh, particular uh, lens, except when we really need to use it, perhaps when we look at bacteria, which are very, very small cells. But uh, most of the time, so if you happen to be using that oil immersion lens, and this is commonly what happens, students will raise their hand and say, first thing, I can't see anything through this lens. You can't see anything unless you put oil on it. That's why it's called the whole immersion one. Objective. Let's uh, let's go back to uh, 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 back to uh, page B five. On page B five, the uh, all right. What is the diameter of the field of view? What does that mean? So you know, uh, if we have if this is, let's say with the uh, shortest lens, the scanning. All right, so here we have this lit up circular field of view. Now, a diameter, as you know, is the distance from one side of a circle to the other. That's called the diameter. All right, so uh, as you, and basically what happens as you increase the magnification, as you go from scanning to low power to high power, you'll notice that the diameter of the field of view is getting smaller and smaller. Now, you might say, I, I don't understand. If you're increasing the magnification, why is the diameter getting smaller? Look, imagine you, were, you, you had a zoom camera, a zoom lens. All right? Now, let's imagine you take a wide angle shot. You got a wide angle view. All right, so you can see everything here, me and everything else. Now. Increase the magnification, zoom in on me. As you increase the magnification and zoom in, can you see that you're actually going to be looking at a smaller area? You've just made it that smaller area appear big. So you can zoom in on just my eyes, right, or my mouth. All right? So the more you increase the magnification, the smaller the area you see. If you then go back for a wide angle shot, you, you look, as you reduce your magnifying power, you actually have a, you take in and see more. So that's why, right up here, we saw on the chart that with the lowest magnification, you've got the biggest diameter uh, of the field of view. And as you zoom in, can everybody see that the diameter of the field of view gets smaller? You're going to have to be using these numbers, incidentally. So that's why all this is important. Uh, you'll also notice one more thing that's shown here. As you increase the magnification, generally it tends to get dimmer. Because uh, in order to get these higher magnifications, the light is actually, the reason why those higher magnification objective lenses are longer is there's more lenses inside it. And the more the light has to go through more lenses, the dimmer it gets. So sometimes you have to increase the light as you go to higher magnification. <clears throat> on, page, uh, on page B6, we're going to be learning how to estimate. You say, what page are we? B6. We're going to be learning how to estimate how big objects are that we see under the microscope. Here, and you'd say, how? So let's use this picture right here on B6 as an example. Let's imagine that uh, we're looking at something under the microscope, and it's at low power magnification. Now, low pa at low power, let's just say that the diameter, the diameter, the distance from here to here is 2,000 micrometers, right? And we uh, abbreviate micrometers like this. Last uh, time we met, we were learning the metric system. Micro is abbreviated with a script U and followed by m for meters. All right? So uh, let's say that the <coughs> diameter is 2,000 micrometers from here to here. Now, incidentally, when we talk about a diameter, which is the distance from one side of the circle to the other, 
It doesn't matter whether I'm talking about the distance from this side to this side, or from this side to this side, or even from this side to this side. You know, if you buy a 12-inch pizza, when they talk about a 12-inch pizza, that means the diameter of it is 12 inches. And it doesn't matter if I'm slicing it this way, or this way, or that way, it's 12 inches in diameter. All right, so in this case, it's, if it's 2,000 micrometers in diameter, it doesn't matter how I draw that diameter line. A diameter line is a line that simply divides a circle in half, however I divide it in half. Now, uh, you'd say, okay, so how does this help me? So we're looking at this organism. This is an organism we're looking under the microscope. And can you see it looks like it's about one-third, about one-third of the diameter? You'd say, how do you get that? Well, in other words, can you imagine that if this is one of these guys, couldn't we have another one about here and another one right about here? So can, can you see that its length is about one-third of that distance? You'd say, OK, so what? So then we should be able to estimate how long it is. You'd say, how would you do that? The length is one-third of 2,000 micrometers. We know that entire diameter is 2,000. So its length is about one-third of it. So you'd say, OK, well, how does that help me? What, you know, one-third of 2,000, well, how, what, what do you do? So you can go and calculate one-third of 2,000. You'd say, yeah, how? You simply say one-third times 2,000 micrometers, which is the diameter. All right? And so that's going to be 2,000 micrometers divided by 3. Now, some of you are saying, but that's not an even number. Uh, we can handle it. All right? Now, uh, if you actually divide 3 into 2,000, and you could even do this by hand, but you certainly have a calculator. You all have a cell phone that calculates. All right? Uh, 3 goes into 20 six times. All right? And, and, and 3 goes uh, into 26 times. That's 18. 20 minus 18 is 2. Bring down a 0. All right? 3 goes into 20 again six times. So what, really, what I did is you're going to basically get 666.66. It never comes out even. You can just say it's about 667 micrometers. So we have now estimated the length of that organism. Now, what if, uh, what if uh, that organism was at a different magnification, and maybe it was a different organism? So uh, again, we have to know what the diameter of the field of view is at different magnification. So on the previous page, I just want to remind you, this chart on page uh, B5, you'd say, what page is this, B5? This chart on page B5, is going to, you're going to be referring to it because it tells you what the diameter of the field of view is at different magnifications. You'd say, well, why isn't the diameter the same at every magnification? We already talked about that. We said as you zoom in on somebody, you're seeing a smaller area. So you have to, depending upon which magnification you're using, know what the diameter is. Incidentally, no matter which magnification you use, it doesn't change the actual size of that organism. So if, whether you're looking at it at low power or high power, you should get the same number. It's just that at low power, it'll take up a smaller space, and at higher power, it'll take up a bigger space. But when you do the calculation, it's the same size. Looking at me at different magnifications did not change how big I was. All right, so uh, you're going to be doing that on your own. Now, uh, on page B7, uh, the focusing knobs. So we use them, obviously, to uh, focus an object. And then there's a concept on page B7 called depth of focus or depth of field. This is a concept that people who do photography are very aware of. If you were going to, if you had a focusable camera, a camera that you could focus, if you focused on my face, the writing behind me would be out of focus. If you focus on the writing there, then my face will go out of focus. Because with any camera, with any lens, with any microscope, it can only have a certain depth in focus at one time. 
So if you focus on me, something that's either closer to you than my, I am or farther away from you than I am will be out of focus. Does everybody follow that? And the same will be true when you're using a microscope. Let's say that as I'm talking about all these things and you read this stuff, let's say you say, you know, I don't understand this. Well, first thing, I'm going to try to get this video posted uh, over the weekend, and you'll be able to rewatch the video. But the idea is you're responsible for understanding what we're talking about. All right, that's also all written there. Okay, on page B8, on page B8, now, uh, let's see, do you have a, uh, I'm trying to remember if you have the, uh, can, yeah, okay, yeah, the, uh, on the, uh, on page B8, So what is a condenser lens and a condenser control knob? So on your microscope, and I believe that it's on your left-hand side, on your left-hand side, there is a knob right below the stage. And it's a black knob. You'll see it's a black knob below the stage. And as you turn it, it actually makes something below the stage go up or down. Can you see that? And what you're actually moving, why don't you actually look right down on the stage, look right down on the stage, and you will see there's a lens as you look down into the stage. And that lens is called the condenser lens. And uh, that condenser lens focuses the beam of light onto the specimen you're looking at. That's what it does. It focuses the beam of light. Everything is written right here. So actually, what you're doing when you turn that black knob is as it raises that condenser lens up or down, it tr uh, you will use it to focus the beam of light better on the specimen. All right? Now, this is the only lens on your microscope that has nothing to do with magnification. Your ocular lens that you look through magnify, the objective lenses that you can switch from scanning to low power to high power to oil immersion, they magnify. The purpose of the condenser lens is not to make something look bigger, it's to focus the beam of light. All right, we're almost done with the parts of a microscope, which are a lot easier than using a cell phone. This uh, all right, the uh, iris diaphragm lever, what's that? So this is a little knob, it's a not really like a stick, it's a thing you can turn right below the stage. There's like a black stick, Does everybody see that? And as you turn the uh, black stick, that's like it's right, right here, right below, right below the stage, right in the very front, not on the side. And, and go ahead and turn it. Yeah? So as you turn it, that changes the amount of light going through the condenser lens. So you can adjust the amount of light going through the condenser lens. Now you might say, well, wait a second. Didn't you tell us the condenser lens does that? No. The condenser lens focuses the beam of light on the specimen. The iris diaphragm lever uh, changes how much light. Now, why is it called iris diaphragm lever? And the answer is that it's named actually based on your own eye. So in terms of the eye, your own eye, now, when you look at somebody's eyes, there's a black spot right there in the middle. That's actually called the pupil. And the pupil, in reality, is actually a hole. It's actually a hole, an opening through which the rays of light go through your own eye. You'd say, wait a second, it's a hole? If I rub my finger over it, I don't feel a hole. I hope not. <laughs> because there's a clear membrane on the front of your eyeball called the cornea. But without that cornea, if you didn't have that clear membrane called the cornea, then you would feel there's a hole there where the rays of light go through. Now, the area surrounding the pupil is called the iris. That's what it's called, the iris. And the iris is actually a pigmented muscle. It's a muscle that may be pigmented blue or brown or green or hazel just bloodshot, but uh, that's called the iris. The purpose of the iris is to adjust how wide open that hole is. 
So just as the iris of your own eye adjusts how wide open or how closed that hole is, that pupil, the iris diaphragm lever adjusts how much light is going through the condenser lens. That's how it gets its name. All right, now on page B9, I've summarized on page B9 how to use the microscope. And I've listed a number of steps that you follow when using the microscope. Now, uh, a binocular dissecting microscope is a different kind of microscope than what we were using. You have a picture here. There's another picture of it on the next page. And that's what some of you were pulling out in that other cabinet. This microscope is very different from the one you're using. First of all, it only magnifies, if you look on the bottom of the previous page, it only magnifies 15x and 30x. Your microscope that you have in front of you magnifies up to 1,000x. So you'd say, then why would you want to use this microscope, this uh, dissecting microscope? And the answer is because you can even look at your own hand. You can look at your fingers. You can look at anything under it because you've got lots of space. In your microscope, the only things you can look at have to be small enough to get right fit on that stage. You can't look at your hand there. So this is lower magnification, but we can look at insects. We can look at earthworms and so on. We can't look at an earthworm or an insect using the microscopes you're using right now. And we don't need such high magnification to look at something that you can see with your own eyes. We'll have more to say about those uh, when we need them. On B12, on B12, we do not have an electron microscope for you to look, use at, at this college. An electron microscope uh, costs a couple of million dollars each one. Uh, and, uh, but they do magnify, as we wrote at the bottom, an electron microscope can magnify 100 or even 200,000 times. Let's say 100,000 times. And it has a resolving power, a resolution, 200,000 times better than the human eye. So the sharpness of an electron microscope is 200,000 times better than the human eye. The electron microscope gives us these incredible uh, uh, magnifying powers that allow us to even see internal structures of a single cell. And uh, why it's called an electron microscope is because it actually uses a beam of electrons. It actually uses a beam of, not a light, but a beam of electrons. And whereas your, light, your microscope uses a beam of light that is, uh, we focus with lenses, uh, the electron microscope uses a beam of electrons that is focused with magnets. Now, uh, on, on page B13, uh, most of the uh, things that we're going to be looking at are prepared slides that have already been prepared. Uh, sometimes they have written on them WM, which means whole mount. Sometimes what may be written on them on the slide is XS or CS, which means a cross-section of something. And almost all these slides have been uh, stained or dyed. They're usually stained or dyed to uh, make whatever we're looking at appear, uh, make it easier to see under the microscope. Now, when we look at something that's alive, we usually have to put water on it. And when we have to put water on it, that's called a wet mount. And the reason why we have to put water on it if it's alive is because if we don't put it in water, it will die. Commonly, when you do prepare a wet mount and you put like a, a leaf uh, and uh, you put some water on it to keep the uh, cells alive, not dry out under the heat of the light, we put something called a cover slip on top of it to keep the water from moving off the slide. But anytime we drop this little cover slip onto a slide with some water, we always get some air bubbles. So if you see these perfect circles, those are not cells. The perfect circles are little air bubbles that form when you have a wet mount and you put the cover slip and drop a cover slip over it. All right, what are we going to be doing today? We're going to be doing a few things. Uh -huh. So the first thing on page B14, on page B14, uh, you've got cork in front of you. So on page 
B14. I have drawn a circle which represents your field of view, that circular area that's lit up. And I've asked you to draw a few of the cells that you see of the cork, the cork cells. Uh, draw a few under low power on the left half, and then just draw a few cells on the uh, right half under high power. That way, and you don't have to draw 100 cells, draw one or two or three. And simply the way they appear to you under low power and high power. So you get a sense of the difference between low power, 100x, and high power, 400x. All right, now, on page B15, on B15, there are slides at the back of the room on the counters that uh, have a letter E on them. And we want you to take a look, after you're done doing the picture of the uh, court, Look at a letter E slide. Now, again, we don't have enough slides for every single person in the room. So E is share, right? It shouldn't take you long. But we want you to draw a picture of what the letter E looks like under either, I wrote low power, or you can even do scanning. But it's not going to look like that. All right? And then uh, on page uh, B16, on B16, we want you to look at a piece of hair. Now, I, we have scissors where you can look at a piece of your own hair, or I think we even have, uh, and we have Lisa Renault at the back, who is our fantastic lab tech. She's our chief lab tech here. And if Lisa, you want to, you could wait. Okay. And, uh, and so, uh, I, I think, do we have some hair in a Petri dish or something? Yes. Okay. So you can either look at your own hair, if you're, the person next to you isn't looking, just cut some hair off them, uh, and, uh, or look at some hair that we've got. Now, you know, even though it shows on page B16 to use water, we don't have to use water. Hair is not alive, it's just a protein. So even though it shows using water, you can just put the hair right on a slide. Not the slides you've got. Don't put it on a cork slide. Put it on, we've got just plain blank slides at the back. And you'll put a cover slip over it. You don't need water. And just draw a picture of what the hair looks like and then estimate how thick the hair is. Now, uh, we're also, I'm going to set up some pond water on demonstration. On page B18, on B18, ooh, look, there's a whole bunch of review questions about what we've been talking about. 